aftershocks of the temple and the rise of the rabbinate. Moving along, can you describe the Jerusalem temple? Why was it important? Define Yom Kippur, Elohim, Tanakh, Babylonian captivity, Shabbat, and Pesach. What is Torah, Navim, and Katuvim? What kinds of materials and themes are found in each? Part 1. The Second Temple Following the Babylonian captivity, the Hebrews rebuilt the Temple of Elohim in the city of Jerusalem in the year 516 BCE. With that, the Temple cult and its priesthood came right back to pick up just where they left off. But now, there were some added features to their religion that would have major ramifications for the future. Most importantly, their literatures, the myths, all the stories, sayings, laws, and songs which were written down or at least compiled during the captivity of the last two generations had a much more central role to the Hebrew people. The religion had shifted during the captivity to account for the absence of the temple cult. So for instance, the Shabbat, the day of rest, and the Pesach, the Passover celebration, were both ways that the Hebrews could participate in their myths, but neither actually required the temple. And so now, even with the new second temple, there were strong religious elements that could work independently of that temple. Now, the god of the Hebrews was still local to the temple in Jerusalem, but he could, at least theoretically, be celebrated with or without that temple in existence. That malleability the ability to celebrate Elohim as God of a particular special place, but also as the God of any place, would prove key to the long-term survival of this people's religion. Jerusalem was never a major city on the international scene. It's actually a rather small city, even by ancient standards. You could walk clear across the old city in about 10 minutes. And neither was it ever a great center of wealth or production. And yet, even though it was neither particularly wealthy or influential on its own, it was the subject of repeated invasions and sieges. The Babylonian invasion was just one of these. There were many more, both before and after that. Now, the reason for this is just a matter of geography. It's all about water and fertile soil. In the ancient Near East, there were three major centers of wealth and power. The first was the Nile River Valley, and most especially the Nile Delta, where the river met the Mediterranean Sea. The Nile was a huge river that brought with it very productive silt. This made Egypt the breadbasket of North Africa and later most of Europe. Another major river system was Mesopotamia's, Babylon in this period. Like the Nile in Egypt, the Tigris and Euphrates rivers provided fresh water and good soil, the stuff that you needed to build a large, stable civilization. And then there were also the coasts of the Greek cultural world, including the mainland of the modern country of Greece, the many Mediterranean islands like Cyprus and Crete, and most especially the Bosphorus, the narrow strait where the Black Sea met the Mediterranean. If you just look on the map, you can tell they make great natural ports, and great ports meant trade and the import of wealth. Well, Jerusalem had none of these things that the Greeks, Babylonians, and Egyptians had. They had no particularly great ports and no major rivers. In fact, the one notable river, the River Jordan, is hardly more than a brook, and the only water it connects to, near Jerusalem anyway, is the Dead Sea, a body of water so salty that it's actually toxic. But then why did Jerusalem get invaded so much? It isn't a particularly wealthy region, but it's strategically perfect. It's right near that one and only one route 
that, by land, connects the Eurasian landmass to Africa. So, basically, it's sitting right next to a bottleneck. If the Egyptians wanted to send armies to Mesopotamia, they would have to pass right through Jerusalem. And if the Mesopotamians wanted to strike back against those Egyptians, they would have had to hit up Jerusalem too. And if you were trading goods along the land routes between the Greek world and Egypt and Mesopotamia, you were very likely to go straight through Jerusalem. So, armies who followed that money along the trade routes, who may or may not have actually even been particularly interested in Jerusalem, would still end up fighting over it quite a bit. By the time of the Babylonian invasion in 597, 10 of the 12 tribes of Israel had already been annihilated by a previous invasion of the Assyrians in the year 722 BCE. So by the time the Babylonian captivity began, the only tribes left were Judah and the much smaller tribe of Benjamin. Then after the captivity, the much smaller, weaker United Nation of Judah, which also included within it the little tribe of Benjamin, was then invaded again, and again, and again. The next major invader was Alexander of Macedon. We've met him already. He invaded in the year 333 BCE. After him, Judah became just one more province of the Hellenistic, or Greek, world. And that Hellenistic invasion brought with it Hellenistic culture. The Greek language, Greek customs, cults, and Greek education. If you wanted to survive in the Hellenic age, it was necessary to speak Greek, dress Greek, participate in Greek cults, and think like a Greek. Hellenism, the spread and adoption of all things Greek by non-Greeks, went everywhere the armies of Alexander went. Some of the people of Judah, the Judeans, saw this as a positive development. With the Greek culture came acceptance into a larger international world. The Greek language brought with it literature and science that was significantly more advanced than anything the Hebrews had ever had before. Greek thought, philosophy, rhetoric, and politics opened up new and exciting ways to think about society, morality, and the universe. Hellenic culture was sophisticated, cosmopolitan. They had epic poetry and public theater. They had gymnasiums and baths and advanced medicine. And so Hellenized Judeans still wanted to belong to their ancestral culture, but they happily tried to fuse it with this new, fascinating culture of the Greeks. But many of the Judeans were strongly opposed to Hellenism. They didn't want to play-act as Greeks, using culture, language, and thought of their imperial oppressors. They wanted to remain their own people, hold on to their own cultural identity. They didn't want to speak Greek, but Aramaic, the Semitic language that replaced Hebrew. And they were interested in the Jerusalem temple of Elohim alone. The people of Judah were supposed to be dedicated to just their national god, just the line of kings descended from David, and just their temple cult. The Tanakh was clear. There weren't supposed to be other kings, gods, and cults. So, when in the year 167 BCE, when one of the Seleucids, that is, one of the Greek families that controlled the northern parts of the Greek world, introduced the Greek god Zeus to the Jerusalem temple, the anti-Hellenist Judeans revolted. One party, led by five brothers called the Maccabees, Aramaic for the Hammers, took the temple back and chased out these Seleucid Greeks, setting up a new independent kingdom of Judah, ruled by the Maccabees and their descendants, who were called the Hasmoneans. This successful Maccabean revolt, by the way, is today celebrated as Hanukkah. But the tension between the Hellenistic and anti-Hellenistic forces in Judah continued. Even without the Greek rulers, some Greek ideas and cultural norms spread and blended together with the Hebrew culture. For the most striking example, Greek thought had something Hebrew myths did not have, a strong distinction between the body and the force that animates bodies, a soul. 
And if you start thinking about souls, you pretty quickly start thinking about the afterlife. This is called eschatology, the study of the end, the study of things that happen after death. The oldest Hebrew literatures weren't very interested in eschatology. They did have a vague notion of an underworld called Sheol, but nothing really happened there. When someone died, their body went into the earth, into Sheol, the underworld, and there they remained, essentially in an eternal sleep. But if you started thinking like a Greek, and it's possible for a soul to be active, independent of a body that may be dead, meaningful things could occur in your afterlife because the soul survived death. And so some Judeans, but not all, started to argue for a future resurrection of the dead, a time in the future when some or all of the souls would be reunited with their bodies, and so the bodies would come back to life again. They would arise out of Sheol. There were also political questions that came out of the Hellenistic world. The Hasmoneans, these kings who had successfully thrown out foreign rulers to become kings themselves, well, they rose to power, but they didn't last forever. They would remain the monarchs of Judah for only a few generations, until they were invaded by yet another empire, this time the Romans. The Roman general Pompey invaded Judah in 63 BCE and turned the kingdom into the Roman province of Judea. The presence of Greek and now Roman rulers begged the question of how the rule of Judah, or now Judea, was supposed to work. The numerous invasions by foreign powers demonstrated clearly that any Judean king could be toppled. Indeed, all of these foreign rulers, people like Alexander and Cyrus, well, they claimed to be divinely appointed or even to be gods themselves. Where was the Judean god Elohim in this process? Well, some of the Judeans saw an answer in the Tanakh. There, on many occasions, God said clearly that David and his family were anointed, Messiah. And the Hasmoneans seemed, for a moment, to fulfill this promise. But they didn't. God said very explicitly many times that David's line would rule forever. So therefore, because God must be speaking the truth, a new Davidic kingdom was going to be restored by an anointed one, a Messiah, the Messiah. This Messiah would cast out foreign rulers forever, and he would usher in a perfect age that would never end. Roman Judea was fragmented by all of these sorts of questions. What was the role of Greek and other kinds of foreign thought in Judean life? Was there a resurrection from the dead? Was there a coming Messiah who would cast out foreign rulers, now the Romans? Part 2. The Revolt and the Diaspora there was a constant population of Judeans who were disgusted by Greek and Roman cultures and wanted to throw out all of their social, economic, and political influence. And this fury got even worse as Roman rule went on. Following a long series of Roman civil wars and the Roman shift from a republican senatorial system of government to rule by Caesars, emperors, Roman rule over the provinces became much more forceful and direct. Finally, the breaking point for Judea came in the year 66 CE, when the people went into open revolt against Rome. But the Judeans didn't stand a chance. They were vastly outnumbered by the Romans, and they couldn't even get close to their technological prowess. The Romans crushed the revolt, and in the year 70, Jerusalem and most of the Second Temple were burned to the ground. Two generations later, in the year 132 CE, the Judeans tried to retake their ancestral homeland under a leader commonly considered to be the Messiah, Simon Bar Kokhba. And for three years, Bar Kokhba and his allies held the Roman forces back. But again, Judea was taken. Bar Kokhba was killed in battle, and hundreds of Judean towns and villages were destroyed. End. 
to prevent any further revolts, the Romans expelled any of the remaining Jews from Jerusalem and their other cities. The Judeans had to live in diaspora, in permanent expulsion from their land, forced to find new homes elsewhere in the empire. Jerusalem was then paganized under the name of the Roman god Jupiter, the Roman equivalent of the Greek Zeus, and temples to the Roman gods were built in the remnants of the old town of Jerusalem. And so, once again, like the Babylonian captivity centuries earlier, the Judeans were a people without a temple to their god, or a land where that god could dwell with them. But this time was a little different. Because the Judeans had gone through a similar process before, their religious system was already somewhat adapted to the problem. They had survived previously without a temple, and far from their own homeland, and therefore they turned to their text, to the Tanakh. The text gave blueprints for their lives, wherever they found themselves, even in foreign lands, even without an extant temple. Texts and myths could be moved from place to place. Circumcision and the Passover and many of the Torah's other mitzvahs could, in theory, be practiced anywhere. The fall of the Second Temple was a disaster for sure, but centuries before, the Judeans' religion developed the means to deal with such a situation. The most successful Judeans in this situation were the Pharisees. They were much more comfortable with Hellenistic and now Roman culture. They often spoke Greek and moved easily in the Greek and Roman world. And because they were already thinking about their culture's place in the larger Greco-Roman world, even before the temple burned in the year 70, the Pharisees were slightly less dependent on the temple's specific cult. Like their ancestors had done when the first temple fell, the Pharisees turned to their myths and literatures, the Tanakh, and so, their central places of religious observance were meeting houses where the Torah and other Hebrew literatures could be read and studied, often in Greek translations, as tabiblia. These were the first synagogues, gathering places, places where the old literatures, the old myths, could be kept alive. And so, when the temple was gone, these synagogues could absorb the Judean religious energies by turning back to their texts, to the Tanakh, to the Hebrew Bible. And those texts demanded teachers, rabbis. A rabbi, just meaning teacher, was someone who taught the Torah and the rest of the Tanakh. Without a priesthood in the temple, or a Davidic king, the people who knew the texts had religious power in the old Judean religion. Even though most of them now spoke Greek and Aramaic, some could read the now-dead Hebrew language of their ancestors, keeping their heritage alive and relaying it to other Judeans through translation. This collection of Torah teachers, called the Rabbinate, and their synagogues weren't new priests or new temples, but they, in a more limited way, fulfilled their role in such a way as to keep the Judean culture alive and going wherever they were they taught their people the Chalakah, the direction of the Torah and their ancestors, the Old Judean Law, the customs, practices, and laws of the Old Judean way of life, how the Torah was to be applied to one's everyday comings and goings. These Pharisee rabbis and their followers had to take up roots in many other places. Many fled into the different regions of the Roman world, setting up refugee communities from Egypt to Spain. Some of these were already in existence, but following the diaspora, these communities swelled to include all the new refugees. Others fled east, out of the Roman Empire entirely and into Persia. And still others fled south, into Arabia and Yemen especially. As each generation passed, they were one step further from the no longer extant province of Judea. They were the children of the children of the children of the people of Judea, maybe, but they weren't from Judea themselves, and so they weren't Judeans anymore. 
but they tried in their various ways to keep Judean worship, literature, and culture alive in all their diverse new homelands. And so, in time, these people were called, in the common language Greek, the Iudaioi, the Judean Isers, the ones who behave like Judeans. They still spoke of themselves, as all ancient ethnic groups did, by a cultural location, an ethnos, Judeans. But they weren't Judeans. They weren't from that place. They weren't from Judea themselves because there was no more Judea. And yet they reenacted the Judean way of life, however they could, across the known world. Part 3 Blessed are you, Hashem, the knower of secrets. In the absence of the temple again, the survivors of Judea and their descendants turned to the myths, especially those found in the Torah. Much of what was found there was again directly relevant to their current problems. The themes of exile, the loss of the temple, and the centrality of this specific people's relationship to their specific God, their status as a chosen people, and their relationship to the specific land that their God had dwelt in along with their ancestors. These themes rang true whether the temple or even the lands of Judea even existed. And a great deal of their culture and practice, therefore, would learn to go with them wherever they were, even in diaspora. But, unlike the Babylonian captivity, which ended rather quickly with the return home and the restoration of the temple, the end of the diaspora didn't come. Judea did not return. The temple was not built a third time and the Romans remained in power. And so the rabbis needed to turn to their textual sources, the Tanakh, the Hebrew Bible, to find more lasting answers. Now some of them didn't change. The Pesach, the Passover meal, could still be celebrated anywhere, as could the Shabbat, the Sabbath rest, and circumcision wasn't bound to any specific place or temple. Likewise, many of the dietary customs, marriage practices, and sexual ethics of the Tanakh could be followed more or less as they always had been. But then, a very large number of the mitzvahs in the Torah, the commandments from Elohim, were directly dependent on the temple and its priesthood. So what do they mean now? How did you live your life in accord with Chalakah when many of the central practices of it weren't even possible? And the Messiah didn't come. Sure, there were some people who had seemed to fulfill that role for a moment, like Simon bar Kokhba, but ultimately, the Davidic kingdom wasn't restored for good, and so therefore it seemed that the Messiah must still be on his way. And to top it all off, the Hebrew language itself was more or less extinct as a daily spoken language. Sure, the rabbis, at least some of them, could read the Old Hebrew, but no one spoke it, and most of the Judeans and their descendants didn't know Hebrew at all. So what are you supposed to do when your God is speaking to you in these very important texts that almost no one could understand? These kind of hermeneutical problems and many others led, as they had during the Babylonian captivity, to a representation of the old myths and customs in new contexts. But Rather than replacing the old anthology of the Hebrew Bible, the rabbis created commentaries on the Bible. They recorded rabbinical discussions and arguments, how the rabbis of the past and the present interpreted the Torah and the rest of the Tanakh in new situations, in new cultures. Here's a simple and very famous story that explains the problem. The story was written down long after the destruction of the Second Temple, but it takes place a bit before that, during the lifetime of the great rabbi Hillel. It begins with a Gentile, a pagan, who thought it was rather funny that the Torah was full of apparently irrelevant teachings and stories that had nothing to do with anything. This unnamed Gentile went to several notable rabbis of the day, daring them to explain the entirety of the Torah to them, while this man stood on one leg. Knowing the task was ridiculous, the pagan even told them that he would take up the Judean way of life himself 
if someone could actually explain the Torah to him. Finally, this mocking pagan stood on one foot before Rabbi Hillel. And Hillel just said, Do not do to another that which is hateful to you. That's the whole of the Torah. And the rest is just commentary. Go and study. Yes, all of the many mitzvahs and stories in the Torah belong to another age and a now lost temple. But there was a principle behind them all. The golden rule. If you don't like something yourself, don't do that to other people. The Torah, on the surface, seemed irrelevant to pretty much anything. But if you read it as commentary, as stories and laws that seem to explain or elaborate upon something more hidden, then the Torah was just as important and worthy of study as it had ever been. The Torah was still a message from God himself through Moses. And even though people now lived in other lands and spoke other languages and had no temple, if you just applied the correct hermeneutics, the Torah remained as significant as ever. That quest for the proper hermeneutics created a huge collection of rabbinical texts which tried to explain how to live out the Torah in all possible situations, in diaspora. The rabbis would debate any and all possible situations, often deliberately ridiculous ones too, and they would ask themselves how was the Torah to be applied now? And these debates, some of them anyway, were written down. The earliest of these commentaries appeared around the year 200 of the Christian calendar. This was the Mishnah, the repetition, or the going back over of something. For example, the Judeans of old used to say their prayers in the Jerusalem temple. And if they weren't there, they could pray in the direction of the temple. So, after the second temple was destroyed, the Judeans in Jerusalem started to pray at the only part of the temple that was left, a segment of the old outer wall on the west, called the Kotel, now often called the Western Wall. Because prayers there were particularly serious, it's also now known as the Wailing Wall. And for most Judeans in the past and Jews today, the Kotel remains the most sacred place in the world. As close to the temple cult as you could get, without the temple itself still in existence. Now, the Torah doesn't say to do any of this, because the Torah speaks as if the temple as a whole still exists and its inner sanctum, the Holy of Holies, is still in operation. But if the Holy of Holies doesn't exist, and neither does most of the temple, you could make do by praying as close to that old site as you can. You could reinterpret the Torah to fit a new situation, even one that the Torah itself doesn't explicitly mention. So, for instance, what if you weren't in Jerusalem? In Diaspora, most Judeans lived far away, and so they couldn't pray at the Kotel. So what did you do? Well, you prayed in the direction of Jerusalem. And to this day, most synagogues are oriented so that the congregants are facing Jerusalem, no matter where in the world they actually are. And the Torah scrolls, as well as the rest of the Tanakh, are stored in a shelf or cabinet as close to Jerusalem as a given building allows. Okay, well what if you weren't in Jerusalem and you weren't in a synagogue? In fact, what if you were in a dangerous place? Well, then you could cut your prayer short. So, one of the rabbinical debates in the Mishnah says, Rabbi Yeshua says, one who is traveling in a dangerous place should offer a brief prayer and say, Save God your people, the remnant of Israel. At every period of transition, let their needs be before you. You are the source of all blessings, God, who heeds prayer. Okay, that's pretty easy. But what if you were traveling, let's say on a donkey, and it was too dangerous to stop and get off your donkey? Well, if one was riding a donkey, he should dismount from it when he prays. And if he were unable to dismount, he should turn his face towards Jerusalem. Okay, so if you can't get off your donkey, 
you can at least turn your face towards Jerusalem and say your prayers while riding. Okay, but what if for some reason you couldn't turn your head? Maybe you have a stiff neck or something. Well then, if he is unable to turn his head, he should focus his heart towards the Holy of Holies. Fine. Well, what about if you're traveling by water and you can't even control the direction in which you're facing? If one is sitting in a boat or in a wagon or on a raft, when he prays, he should focus his heart towards the Holy of Holies. The rabbis of the Mishnah were taking each of the Torah's specific mitzvahs, its commandments. They would lift them further from the Torah's specific wordings and expose ever more nuanced and specific interpretations. So you can follow the Torah anywhere, even if the Torah does not explicitly say how to handle a given situation. So even if you're far from Jerusalem, in a dangerous place, while on a donkey and you have a stiff neck, you can still say your prayers. And this interpretation and reinterpretation of the Torah kept going on even after the Mishnah was written. And not only were the rabbis still debating the Torah, now they started debating the Mishnah too. And so ever more commentaries were created by ever more rabbis debating the Mishnah, which was debating the Torah. These commentaries on commentaries fell into two major recorded collections. Both of them are called Talmud, meaning studies. The first was compiled in the areas surrounding the old province of Judea, in the geographical location called Palestine, around the year 400. And so it's called the Palestinian Talmud, the records of the rabbis of Palestine debating upon the Mishnah's debates about the Torah. A similar, more important, and much larger collection appeared around the year 600 amongst the rabbis in Babylonia. So this is called the Babylonian Talmud. The Babylonian Talmud, which is much more detailed than the Palestinian one, remains to this day the most influential text in Jewish history after the Tanakh itself. It's absurdly vast, like an encyclopedia of rabbis discussing the Torah and the Mishnah over many centuries. By the time the Babylonian Talmud was completed, it consisted of 63 books called tractates. Together they are over 6,000 pages long in print, so they'd be even longer in handwritten manuscripts. And they get into even more specific details than the Mishnah. So, the Torah suggests, but never actually says, that you should pray towards Jerusalem whether the temple exists or not. The rabbis of the Mishnah explain how you could follow this principle in all sorts of other situations. In Jerusalem, not in Jerusalem, in a cart, and so on. Well, if you get to those conclusions, because the principle of the Torah is that prayer should try to face the old temple, well, then doesn't the same principle suggest that less pious things than prayer shouldn't be done in that direction? If holiness, prayer, faces Jerusalem, maybe things that aren't holy should be done not facing Jerusalem. And so, the Talmud says, explaining the Mishnah, explaining the Torah, there is another teaching. He who wishes to exercise his natural functions, meaning use the restroom, if he is in Judea, he must not face east nor west, but north or south. If he's in Galilee, north and south are prohibited. East and west is permitted. Galilee is to the north of Judea, so to face north and south there would still be facing the temple. Rabbi Jose, however, permits it in any direction, because he used to say, that the prohibition only applies to one who can see the temple. Rabbi Judah says it's prohibited while the temple is standing, but when the temple is no longer standing, it is permitted. Rabbi Akiva prohibits it in all circumstances. So if you follow the principle along, it takes you into ever more specific and often odd places, like the direction in which you should be facing while you use the restroom. And these kind of rabbinical debates over the Torah's stories and his halakha appear throughout the Babylonian Talmud. But why? Why on earth is this important to know? Well, first, 
there's something important to notice about these silly kinds of arguments. There's no conclusion. The Talmud never actually says which rabbi you're supposed to listen to. If Rabbi Jose is right, it doesn't matter which way you go to the bathroom, as long as you can't see the temple at the moment, and at the time the temple doesn't exist anyway. If Rabbi Judah is right, then it doesn't matter whether you can see the temple or not, just whether it exists, which again, it doesn't anymore. And if Rabbi Akiva is right, then the rule stands either way, temple or not, whether you can see it or not. All right, so why go through all this trouble documenting and then studying a debate over a very nitpicky subject that doesn't have a solution anyway? Well, because the argument itself is the point. Remember that, like during the Babylonian captivity centuries before, the rabbi's argument is evidence that the old local religion of the Torah is still in effect somehow temple or not, Jerusalem or not, in Hebrew or not, the covenant between Elohim and the Judeans, their chosenness, is forever. Therefore, it is up to them to ask the simple question of, how? The debate is an act of devotion. It's the descendants of the Judeans trying to keep their side of the covenant. How is the Torah still in effect? It's like infinitely adding sub-paragraphs and clauses onto a contract because you need to make sure it's binding in every possible instance. There's a cliche about this, by the way. What do you get when you have four rabbis? Five arguments. It's a joke, to be sure, but it's a serious one. The more the rabbis and their students bickered, the more specific and esoteric their discussions were, and so the more secret their findings. It's like arguing your way to God. In many Jewish circles to this day, students will only study the Talmud in pairs, not alone. They'll read out together what they're supposed to be studying and try to explain to each other what they think it means. They're supposed to be debating about it. It's not about solving the problem. It's about engaging the problem, right? It's about mystery in the old sense. Without a temple cult, this is how you participate in the myths. The argument itself becomes the sacred experience, the place, as it were, where you encounter Elohim. Like moving through the concentric layers of the temple, with each layer of debate, one moves closer and closer to the place where God dwells, the place where God's will is known. Some questions for next time. Define Hellenism, Messiah, Halacha, Synagogue, Rabbi, Kotel, Diaspora, Mishnah, and Talmud. What were some questions and new ideas that arose in the Second Temple period? What are the functions of the Mishnah and the two Talmuds? What are they doing? 